So this was an offshoot of uh, two weeks ago where Brene Brown had this reaction to anxiety. I think we're supposed to befriend anxiety, but I call bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. We hate you! Hate, hate, hate you! We hate you! So Brene Brown has her loaded pissed offness or hatred, and then she'll ignore the research or fight it and tweak things. And that was evident, this audio part. If you look across the research, you learn that anger is an emotion that we feel when something gets in the way of a desired outcome or when we believe there's a violation of the way things should be. When we feel anger... A violation of the way things should be. <laughs> That's moral judgment. We believe that someone or something else is to blame for an unfair or unjust situation. This is more hatred, not anger. So that's the way she uses anger. And that something can be done to resolve the problem. Punishing someone else, probably. Anger is an action emotion. We want to do something when we feel it. And that is her code for saying terror of negative emotions. <laughs> that is her code for how do I transfer my pain to somebody else? This is codependency, ladies and gentlemen. It is a neurotic drive, no choice, no freedom, to serve, to serve, to submit, to fawn, to supplicate. It is a terror of negative emotions in yourself and in others. Because she has... We hate you! We hate you! We hate you! We hate you! She wants distance from anger. It's her way of creating boundaries. Boundaries, the distance that I can love me and you simultaneously. Distance simultaneously. Distance simultaneously. Boundaries, the dis... So hatred allows her to create more distance from anxiety. The problem with creating distance from anxiety is anxiety is her humanity and your humanity. So she's hating humanity in this code. And she's even sort of coding the definition of anger to make herself look less dehumanizing. I've spent a lot of my career saying that anger is a secondary or indicator emotion that often conceals emotions that are harder to recognize, name, or own. But according to... She thinks it's secondary, which means she has an integrator angry baby. She thinks it's secondary in the face of research. Listen to the other research as she presents it. 91% of emotion experts, I'm wrong. Yes, 91% of emotions experts believe that anger is a primary emotion. So in the face of 91% of the experts in the research, what is her reaction? What do you think? She's going to dig in deeper. <laughs> Maybe it's semantics and our differences come down to how we define primary, or maybe I've got it and had it all wrong. Honestly, there are a lot of debates in the research that I... <laughs> There's a lot of debates on the research that I have no time to read. Honestly, there are a lot of debates in the research that I don't think are worth digging into. That she just thinks isn't worth reading into, okay? Because they don't teach us much. They don't teach us. <laughs> Not, you know, I don't think I'm going to re read it because I don't think it's going to teach us much, even though I'm at 91% against. 91% <laughs> thinks it's primary. I totally disagree, but I'm not going to read the research. That's just what she said. But this debate is worth understanding. As a former union organizer and a lifelong activist, I think anger is often the most compassionate response to experiencing or witnessing injustice. Now listen to what comes next. It can be a powerful catalyst for change that does not need to be explained or justified. Did you hear that part? Does not need to be explained or justified. That does not need to be explained or justified. That gives her a perfect out to offload her feelings. So much easier to offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. Offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. That's why she's a social justice activist right here. She said she can use her anger 
Call it compassion. Compassionate response to experiencing or witnessing injustice. It can be a powerful catalyst for change that does not need to be explained or justified. And she doesn't have to explain or justify it. She says she's fighting the big cause. I'm disgusted. I feel angry. I can offload my pain on you. <laughs> and she owns it. So much easier to offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. Offload pain than yeah. to feel pain. And I still think behind the anger is a tempest of pain, grief, betrayal, disappointment, and other emotions. Sometimes owning our pain and bearing witness to struggle means getting angry. When we deny ourselves the right to be angry, we deny our pain. <laughs> you deny the right to get angry to hate somebody. We're denying our pain. She's created a black and white, some sort of weird equivalency. Borderline-like. And then listen to how she describes hurt. These are weasel words. Pain and hurt are not precise enough of an emotion. It's not granular enough for you to make sense of it. It's not precise enough. But it's nice to get attention, because hurt is this. Let's talk about hurt. I'm not hurt. sure there's a braver sentence in the human catalog of brave sentences. This is the most bravest sentence that's coming, in her opinion. Sentences. Then, my feelings are hurt. Which is just a variation of. I'm just feeling really attacked right now. I'm feeling really attacked right now. I'm just feeling really attacked right now. And what's the code of my feelings are hurt? My feelings are hurt is you caused it. And you need to change. <laughs> that's the formula. How it, she's probably going to explain that, right? So the bravest sentence in the world is my feelings are hurt. Then my feelings are hurt. It's simple, vulnerable, and honest. Vulnerable and honest. What does it say? It just, it's vague. But we don't say it very often. We get pissed off, we hurt back, or we internalize the hurt until we believe we deserve it and that something is wrong with us. But rarely do we say, this really hurt my feelings. I know people who say this all the time. It's part of their script. I'm just feeling really attacked right now. I'm feeling really attacked right now. Just feeling really attacked right now. Feeling really attacked right now. Just feeling really attacked right now. Feeling really just feeling just feeling really attacked. That's the opening. I'm offended. That's essentially the same thing. I am so offended and hurt. <laughs> you must change. That's it. <laughs> I am so offended and hurt. You are you are evil. It's, it's, that's what you do first. You say, "I'm offended. I'm hurt. I have pain. You must change." Perfect formula. The definition of hurt from a team of researchers led by Anita Evangelisti goes a long way in explaining why acknowledging hurt is so difficult. The definition is coming. Are you ready? They write, quote, Individuals who are hurt experience a combination of sadness at having been emotionally wounded. They are sad because they got emotionally wounded. Because they think they are supposed to be entitled to never have emotional pain. Is that one? <laughs> I am sad I have an emotional wound. I am sad I'm human. I guess. So that's the first part of hurt. What's the other part? And fear of being vulnerable to harm. I am afraid that I'm human and I'm vulnerable to harm. I am not 100% armored up. I have a guard up for sure. I have a guard up for sure. I have a guard up for sure. Something got through my defenses. Damn it. I'm hurt. When people feel hurt, they have appraised something that someone said or did as causing them emotional pain. They're basically having an emotional reaction and blaming you. They're basically having an emotional reaction and blaming you. They're basically having an emotional reaction and blaming you. And they just say, like you're attacking me, attacking me. Like you're attacking me. Attack I'm just feeling really attacked right now. Feeling really attacked. I'm really worked up right now. My nervous system is really what really high right now. So if Brene Brown and other teachers are saying the right things, or they're saying things that sound sort of true, if the energy and the tone of their delivery is hatred or pissed offness, 
or sadism or rejection or it's this. Screw you. Bring it. You think you can best me? Screw you. Screw you. Screw you. Then it's going to be hard to apply because the energy behind the words and what she's doing is a dissonance. So the problem is we have these experts who hate humanity, who hate sad baby, who like ordering people around, and they teach you what they know. Brene Brown is teaching from her blind spot. They're teaching hatred. They're teaching judgment of humanity. It's Screw you. Bring it. You think you can best me? Screw you. Screw you. Screw you. And they're armored up. You take this armor off, we die. We die. We die. You take this armor off, we die. We die. We die. So what if the key, what if the missing element is positive use of hatred or the benefit of hatred, the gift of hatred, the gift of disgust, the gift of contempt, the gift of triggers? Because they're using hatred on us, but it doesn't look like hatred because it's underneath the surface, it's in the tone. So if we had ownership of our hatred, we could find ourselves again. Or how many people here think that hatred is a positive or negative thing? I think hatred is a holding on to. Oh, so there's a laser focus, sort of resentment, holding on. Nice, it's holding on to. Ellie is afraid of hatred. Other people's hatred, your hatred, all hatred in general. Yeah, it's scary. <laughs> My hate, yeah, the hatred I feel. And whenever I observe, whenever I witness it, it's, it's, it scares me. I'm frightened. Yeah. Hatred is scary. That's nice. Okay. If hatred is scary, maybe hatred is powerful. Because hatred... Hatred is a sign of the complete loss of your boundaries in the presence of someone who is living out your shadow. Your boundaries are gone. Hatred is a sign of the complete loss of your boundaries in the presence of someone who is living out your shadow. Your boundaries are gone. So we've had this as a good pointer. Boundaries are the realization where I stop and you begin. I stop and you begin. I stop and you begin. But if we're dealing with someone who is sadistic, who owns their hatred, uses their hatred to dump toxic stuff on you, then hatred... Hatred is a sign of the complete loss of your boundaries in the presence of someone who is living out your shadow. Your boundaries are gone. So if hatred is a, is a tool that kills all boundaries, that's why it's a one-two step, doubt and contempt. Contempt and hatred is what destroys boundaries. That's what knocks you senseless. That's what makes a codependent feel shame and desperate because contempt. Laden with contempt. 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 They're there to get under your skin. 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 That's another term for boundary violation. Under your skin. So if I just send daggers. Dagger driven into you. Dagger driven into you. Dagger driven into you. Dagger. Of subtle hatred that doesn't look like hatred. Subtle digs through tone and pace and energy. Relentless. Eventually it gets through your defenses and destroys all your boundaries. That's the purpose of hatred. That's why Brene Brown is using that to block anxiety. We hate you! 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 Anxiety is what makes you human, but anxiety means you have to accept your limitation. You might not have enough time. You might not be able to meet your expectation. You might fail. All of that's anxiety. But you could also su succeed, so anxiety is also anticipation. Excitement. 
Your hatred is extremely important. It will show you exactly what is unfinished in you, what is unloved in you, what is unwelcome in you. Hatred is a sign of the complete loss of your boundaries. Anger is about the boundaries from the outside, so if people are challenging you or trying to abuse you, your anger should step up. So this is another part. She puts hatred in the anger family, but anger is normal anger, where you say, state your need, you protect your boundary, you say, I matter. That's your I, I matter energy to someone else or to the world. I matter. Shame is about boundaries with your own self. So Shame is the opposite side of boundaries. Boundaries within. What are my limitations? How far can I go? How far can I go that meets my standards and values? Can I control myself when I'm triggered? How well do I perform under a stress situation that meets my personal values, my moral structure? That's shame. So that you aren't doing anything that would challenge or abuse others, right? Anger and shame work together to keep you upright and to keep you socially worthwhile. When hatred comes up, what it says is your boundaries are gone. This person and their evilness has come in and has broken all your boundaries and your shame is gone too because you're willing to go out and attack back. So they trigger your hatred triggers your shame to fall apart where you want to reciprocate hatred back. And you know you're willing to, you have an impulse that wants to get even, right? Resentment. So then you spend all your time self-restraining yourself, feeling more shame, shaming yourself because the hatred they dumped onto you destroyed your shame, destroyed your self-restraint, because that's what hatred does. So you take the, the hatred they gave you, you want to give it back to them, but it, since you know you're going to be reactive abuse, you're going to go too far, or you don't know how to get away with it, or you, you're scared of what you're going to do to them, you take their self-hatred towards your shame, so you now have Tons of self-hatred, which is a common thing for codependence, right? Because you're trying to keep yourself shamed so you don't react. You don't become a narcissist. You don't become abusive. Right. So hatred is a sign of complete boundary devastation. Your boundaries are gone. Hatred is considered a part of your shadow, a part of the things that you can't accept in yourself and you demonize in others. But the positive side of hatred, even though you might not lash out your hatred, you still get pissed off. You still get triggered. You still act out. So when you act out, that hatred can be reverse engineered as something that you've disowned, something you put into your shadow, something that needs to be integrated. A lost part of yourself that will make you complete, that will show you what you care about. So hatred is the complete loss of your boundaries in the presence of someone who is living out your shadow. The gifts are intense awareness, piercing intense awareness, piercing vision, piercing vision. That's part of Holly saying that, that you can't let go. Piercing vision, sudden evolution, sudden evolution. So it's a growth uh, turbocharger. <laughs> so you want faster growth, sudden evolution. You want a shortcut. Hatred. What wounded healer is going to teach that? What therapist is going to teach that? Let's go speed up your healing. Let's dive into hatred. <laughs> Let's fuel the resentment and see where it can go. Who's going to go there? and of course, shadow work. Um, the internal questions are, what has fallen into my shadow? What's in my shadow? What's in my blind spot? And what must be reintegrated? What am I losing and what am I trying to dump out? So when you send your hatred out, disperse it to whatever you're hating, you're giving up your power because you're usually fighting a projection, a scapegoat. You're not actually, you have no leverage when you hate. 
even Brene Brown hating anxiety. She's just hating a projection. It's not, it's getting the, her shame out, but it's a constant job of having to dump her pain all the time. It's not empowering her. If she could take that hatred of anxiety, figure out the unmet need, then she could integrate it. She could become more human, but hatred is a way to become deep, to attack your humanity. So. And what must be reintegrated? Your hatred, if you don't know how to control it and you don't know what it's about, makes you into a monster. It makes you into a monster. If you can't control your hatred, you turn into a monster and then you can say, Screw you. Bring it. You think you can best me? Screw you. Screw you. Screw you. You take this armor off, we die. We die. We die. Screw you. Bring it. You think you can best me? Screw you. Screw you. Screw you. We hate you! We hate you! We hate you! We hate you! We Turn you into a monster and then you can create an artifice of sugar. Make it humorous so then you don't look like a monster. But still there. So it's the profound mirror. Hatred is a crucial emotion to understand because when you're focusing that laser pointed, you know, rage and um, dehumanization, it's important to understand what you've become. So it gives you this laser pointed kill, killer instinct. <laughs> Protective instinct. This fucking matters type energy. And if you disown your hatred, or you just used it on yourself. Then it's inverted. It's self-hatred. And in a sense, if I'm an abuser, I can get you to hate yourself. Use all your laser guided wit missiles straight onto yourself. You're defenseless, which is what I want as a manipulator. It tells you what is missing inside you. If you can learn to work with your hatred, you can evolve as a human being. You've got a strong internal moral structure that is not going to be pulled off into impotent, childish expressions of hatred that you haven't owned. So this is healthy hatred. You don't have this childish, impotent, whatever, how did she phrase Moral it? structure that is not going to be pulled off into impotent, childish expressions of hatred that you haven't owned. Normally the self-help people say, you're regressing, stop regressing. That's using hatred on your inner child <laughs> to force yourself through hatred and judgment to grow up. That's not the way is you need to have your hatred, anger and shame working so you have external boundaries and internal boundaries in alignment with reality so you stand up solid you have good grounding and you can move through the actual world but if you create an injunction that says i'm regressing you're regressing you're just pointing fingers and labeling what's good and bad you're using your hatred at projections creates the illusion of sort of learning and growing, but it's not. It's a shell game. That you haven't identified and that you haven't worked with. Hatred, the complete loss of your boundaries in the presence of someone who is living out your shadow. It tells you what is missing inside you. Your hatred is extremely important. It tells you what is missing inside you. And it's scary because it's powerful. <laughs> and you should be scared because this is someone who integrates her hatred and you can't even see it. But all I saw was dirty fighting. Shame, humiliation, put downs, you know, stuff that leaves marks. And I can default there when I'm in like a powerless corner. I can come out like mean. She can come out mean. Does it look like it happens often? 
mean, mean. I know. Throwing elbows and headbutts. Yeah, no, for sure. And verbal ones that really yeah. are way more serious than a physical headbutt. I really am a bad trash talker and super competitive. So whether it's like ping pong or we play a lot of family four square. Yeah. Um, Who trash talks playing ping pong? Four square? I don't know. Maybe that's a tough game. But ping pong trash talker. That's Brene Brown. I play a lot of cards. I'm like a shit talker. Wow. Yeah, a terrible shit talker. You know, I can see it. I can see oh it. Oh my God, yes, you can see yeah, it. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, I know. Throwing elbows and headbutts. Yeah, no, for sure. And verbal ones that really yeah. are way more serious than a physical headbutt. Stuff that leaves marks. Way more serious than a physical headbutt. Stuff that leaves marks. I can see oh it. Oh my God, yes, you can see yeah, it. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, stuff, stuff that, that leaves, leaves marks. marks. And this posture is a bully posture. Don't fucking mess with me. Stuff that leaves marks. So if you find a wounded healer that's going to bully you into healing, <laughs> they're just teaching you to bully yourself. And codependents often have tons of self-hatred already. So sort of counterproductive. So how many people are willing to entertain a uh, positive use of hatred? Or do people still have hate on hatred? <laughs> or hatred is scary? That's like getting to this point. This is a harder sell, but I think he was honest when he shared this. Here's the thing. Our partners don't even really hurt us. Narcissists don't even really hurt us. All they do, the partners that we engage, the partners that we employ, the partners that we recruit, all they do is expose to you what was already in you that happened in your childhood. We've been blaming narcissists for all of our problems. We've been blaming the booger man for all of our issues when all they did because we recruited them and let them into our lives is exposed in us what was already in us, which is actually doing you a favor because then you get a chance to work on it. So instead of recruiting another abuser, you can follow your hatred as a shadow work process to be the reflective mirror so you don't have to get another abuser to force you to relive it all. Or in a sense, maybe that's what we're doing watching the Johnny Depp Amber Heard. We're getting to get secondary gain of having flashbacks through their fuck up mess. <laughs> so we can watch our reactions of hatred, pissed offness and judgment to sort of see what's missing in our lives. Your hatred is extremely important. It tells you what is missing inside you. Your hatred is extremely important. It tells you what is missing inside you. Your hatred is extremely important. It tells you what is missing inside you. Your hatred is extremely important. It tells you what is missing inside you. Your hatred is... Or, if hatred is too much, learning more about anger and shame would be a baby step. And codependents have issues with anger because of conflict averse. And they have issues with shame because of toxic shame. Any sort of guilt or whatnot makes a codependent fall apart and try to rescue, be a slave. So what is the purpose of anger and shame? That was in the hatred video, but it was sort of fast. So here's a clip of that. Anger is about the boundaries from the outside, so if people are trying to abuse you, your anger should step up. Shame boundaries with your own self. You aren't doing anything that would abuse others, right? Anger and shame work together to keep you socially worthwhile. Anger and shame work together to socially worthwhile. So you sort of need both, right? So if someone's getting to your space smothering you, you need some anger to say, back off or you need some anger to back off yourself <laughs> I'm getting away from crazy 
I'm my body is important enough. I'm not going to drown with this person. That's anger. You don't have to push them away. You can push yourself away. Self-protection. That's anger. Shame is like on how much can I help this person without drowning? Maybe I'll throw them a rope. Maybe I'll call number one one. Maybe I'll say fuck it, screw it. That's your shame. Shame is your ability to recognize how much you can do. <laughs> that's good or bad. In this case, she's talking about the dangerous part, but also your capability of doing stuff. That's your shame, your self-awareness. So if I shame you, I make you highly self-aware of your limitation. That's shame. But if you already knew your limitation, any new capability, whatever shame I give you wouldn't evoke any new shame. I go, I've already explored that. I suck here, 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 and here. You want me to tell you all the ways I'm good or bad? I'll give you a report. I've already done there. I've already been there. I've been a failure here, 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 here. Shame me more. You got nothing new. I already know. I've explored all my limitation and shadow. Your shame has nothing on me. So, anger and shame. This is more practical. Or baby step. Anger is about the boundaries from the outside. So if people are trying to abuse you, your anger should step up. Shame, boundaries with your own self. You aren't doing anything that would abuse others, right? Anger and shame work together to keep you socially worthwhile. Anger and shame work together to keep socially worthwhile. So boundaries with your own self. That's a nice shortcut for shame. Shame boundaries with your own self. Having boundaries with your own self. So then you'll recognize other people's boundaries and not overcross them. So you'll, you'll recognize that you have a need that's being triggered by the situation. And if you invade somebody else to get a fix, that you being a codependent cookie seeker. But codependents are scared of toxic shame, so they don't feel shame, so then they cross boundaries. That was uh, this clip from October 2020. He doesn't need to dis dissociate you. Cause you guys to dissociate when you go into your own your stories. It doesn't take work to dissociate a codependent. Come on, right? But when you're dissociated, that's the end makes you dissociate. This is especially easy to accomplish with borderlines and codependents. Go into this hypnotic trance-like states, even in therapy, because they, these um, kind of people transfer the regulation of their emotions and their moods to their intimate partners. So that's not enough shame. A codependent isn't able to recognize the need to self-regulate, so they impulsively use somebody else to help self-regulate. And then, if the video is big enough, you can go look at Brenda, Kirk, and Ben's reaction. But Brenda is the most emotive <laughs> as the words are coming out. You're more prone oh, right to there. external. <laughs> He's like, oh fuck, it sinks in right here. <laughs> their moods to their intimate partners. And then the head bob right here. Your that is shame. <laughs> when the truth is too heavy, you collapse and hide. Self-realization, realization of her limits, creates shame and there's a body overreaction. More prone to externally regulate, so you're giving up your authority to self-regulate. Or you that's all you know. Maybe you aren't consciously doing it. While Kurt is like nodding and saying, oh, this is something new. See, he's receptive. He's showing some level of receptivity where this is some sort of tension to try to block the news. 
and Ben is dis dissociating. But yeah, Ben's always like that. <laughs> but by definition, you regulate externally, and a narcissist now can take advantage of that door. But that's a giant weakness of codependence that you externally regulate, and that's what you're doing in this group when you're trying to make sense of things by getting other people to validate you with a cookie story because you're continuing to use other people. All right, see, now you got like depression there. <laughs> Truth is too heavy. Crossing other people's boundaries. And Kurt smiling, see? He's, he can tolerate some truth intensity to self-regulate your bullshit but by doing that the narcissist can now hypnotize you and destroy your life for another 20 fucking years do you do this the way that you're saying that is really hard to hear yeah can you say it again it was, it's true i need to hear part? it again so as a codependent or borderline by definition you regulate externally. You use other people to regulate your emotions. Crossing other people's boundaries to self-regulate your bullshit. After I dropped this, you had two people, Carol and Cheryl, asking for a repetition. And guess what happens? This is when the group revolts and wants to block the news. When shame is too intoxicating, too heavy, truth is too heavy, too much self-awareness. Shame is self-awareness. Too much self-awareness. I'm vulnerable. I'm too human. That's shame. Codependents intellectualize, rescue other people, anything to get away from shame. I need to Which hear it it, it was just, you said it so fast, I'm trying to take it in, because it's As so a codependent or borderline, by definition, you regulate externally. You use other people to regulate your emotions. Okay, stop right there. Give me an example. Allison jumps in, stop right there. See? Is that please, is just a injunction. Example, how, how do you do that? Let, let me ask first. Then she says, fuck you, Cheryl, let me ask first. That's essentially meaning, right? My needs matter more than yours, Cheryl, even though you got the word in first and you want to hear it again. Let me disrupt everything because I, my needs matter more than anybody else in the room because I feel shame. Would that be if you had a malignant parent who always made the decisions for you? And you just, you, you didn't even know they were malignant, but you just kind of. Would that be because there's someone I can hate, someone I can blame, like a malignant parent, so I don't feel shame about myself. <laughs> Essentially, that's a wording. You're intellectualizing, so I can have someone to blame, so I feel less shame about myself. But if I have less shame about myself, I have less self-awareness. So then I will continue the patterns of being using hatred and judgment to run over other people's boundaries and just live as a parasite, live as an abuser. They always did I, told you how to do everything. Would that be a, a, how you would end up like now? If your parents always made the decisions for you, they took on all the risk. So they're regulating the danger of the decision making. Okay, what about culturally? Culturally in a patriarchal society where, again, you're... Oh, parents isn't enough, so let me hate culture and the parents so I don't have to feel so bad that I, I am limited. I felt too much shame from that, so let me get an okay or some validation that there's Female other people and to hate. all the decisions, let's say, just hypothetically, Catholic culture, men, no separation of church and state, so you're a second-class citizen anyway. And let me add a bunch of words so that I forget the emotion. Brenda is going to do that much better soon. Would that be part of it? Could it be? Culturally, there's codependent training. Our education okay. system teaches you to just trust authority, okay. delegate to the person in charge. No, yes, no. Also, externally regulating. Thanks. No further question. You're masturbating on on each <laughs> other. So, Call meeting. 
See, so now I try to escalate again because she dissipated the emotion. But my escalation to bring back the shame gets sabotaged by Brenda now. I guess I'm so you this is what I've done for 61 years that it seems normal. This doesn't yes. seem normal. This is constant cross. Now that's somewhat shame, so Sharon was able to hold some of it. Crossing of boundaries feels she's totally playing dumb. normal to you. But I don't even see how we're crossing I don't see boundaries. It. It's so sad. It's terrifyingly sad and pitiful. Yes. yes. But it takes some time. See, that's also your self-regulation. You want me. Oh, Ben is also getting angsty, anxious. He's now smiling to try to contain his unease. To give you an answer so you understand this right now, but this is 30, 20, 40 years of not seeing it. You can't get an answer based on your fucking demand. Understanding doesn't always come based Thank on you, your bro. fucking whim. Yeah. Okay. And that's why codependents feel anxiety. You want stuff to happen faster than real time. You're wrestling with time. And then when other things happen too fast, you get surprised. <laughs> Speeding up time is catch-22. You're going to get your flashbacks and all the negative stuff happening just as fast as your growth. So if you're going to fight time, you're going to... You have to pay the price on both sides, so, and anxiety is a problem. So Brenda jumps in to try to do something. Okay, I've previously, my, my world is shattered. We're in a fight. He's not talking to me. I'm not going to feel good until he acts or until this happens or until I whatever. And so I'll press it, press it, push the button, push the button, push the button, go to work, be in my head, crying at my desk. And then she just said she just pushes button constantly she openly admitted that she's just pushing buttons incessantly <laughs> then what the minute the minute that it changes then life is perfect again life is perfect i don't even remember the last 20 hours she forgets the last 20 hours of pushing buttons and spiraling she got her fix because everything is great. And it doesn't matter if it's a relationship or it could be a fight with a friend. It could be a problem at work that you're perceiving that's like crazy. And then the moment that like some external factor makes that better, then all of a sudden it's roses again. And it's fine. It's right. beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So that's sounds like an addict. Every that's an addict. Every day. You got your fix. Mm -hmm. So are you saying we just have to own it? Accept it and just... Allison didn't get enough. Now she wants to self blame Just own it and stop trying to look for reasons to rationalize it. That There's no it. fucking rush. You've already wasted your life on the narcissist. What's another six months to figure something out? Why are you guys in such a hurry? We want reasons. We don't want to like look into ourselves and say... It yes, was that's why you yeah, don't want to look into fine. yourselves. Go look into yourselves. It's beautiful right. in there. After you sort through all the weeds and the ghosts and the scary stuff and you get into your core, it's beautiful in there. It's hard to figure out how to um, repair yourself, like repair yourself from trauma. There's nothing broken. <laughs> so that's countering the self-hate. It's very hard to counter the self-hate for codependence. I mean, like, maybe it's just your attitude, like your... See, she's a... I want to fix my attitude. There's something broken. Like your yes, attitude. your attitude is broken because you've taken on the narcissist in everybody else's wounds because codependents love to be pain suckers. I'm just... You just look for pain to suck and things to fix. That's why instead of being like, this is bad because this is <laughs> happening and th uh, this is bad because X, the weather is shit, so I, this is bad, so I can't. It's more like... We have to it's fine. Positive. Positivity. The world's collapsing, but a new world is coming. It's beautiful. Enjoy the train wreck. Exactly. What's the hurry? <laughs> oh, so back to anger and boundaries. The summary. Anger is about the boundaries from the outside. So if people are trying to abuse you, your anger should step up. Shame boundaries with your own self. 
you aren't doing anything that would abuse others, right? Anger and shame work together to keep you socially worthwhile. Anger and shame work together to keep socially worthwhile. So if you have anger and shame working together, your social value goes up. If it doesn't work together, you can feel shame and then you can socially bully the whole group for your needs. Continuing the pattern of competitive needs and transactional love, which is what codependents only know. That feels like home. Anger is about the boundaries from the outside. So if people are trying to abuse you, your anger should step up. Shame boundaries with your own self. You aren't doing anything that would abuse others, right? Anger and shame work together to keep you socially worthwhile. Anger and shame work together to keep socially worthwhile. And let's go into anxiety. So here's my simple cell of anxiety. Anxiety is your feedback mechanism. When your boundaries of anger and shame are balanced. When your boundaries of anger and shame are imbalanced, you feel more anxiety because your social place is unstable. Your defenses of being able to say you matter and take up space with anger, that's uncertain. Your ability to self-regulate and self-manage and self-limit yourself when you feel shame is limited. So your anxiety will be skywalking out the wazoo. But since psych psychological anxiety is all your map of the world and other maps of the world, so abstract, here's a sort of physical metaphor that sort of describes uh, bad anxiety. But you know, you'll walk by someone like that who's muttering away to the voices in his head and you know, maybe striking out against whatever it is that's plaguing him and you'll make eye contact you might even go across the street, you're certainly going to give him a wide berth, you're going to keep a distance between him and you. Distance between him and you. Now don't we do this when we see someone who's crazy and shouting out stuff and erratic in person? Physically if they're acting out, we know to create give, give space, but if someone's psychologically borderline and drowning, that's when we want to jump in and join them. <laughs> but physically, if you see crazy, you're like, oh, let me get some space. <laughs> Psychologically, it's like, oh, next rescue project, let me move in. Is that the difference? We inhabit time and space, and our territories are spatial temporal. We're here now, and this is safe now. So safe because none of you are manifest. So anxiety is your mechanism to see if you have enough time and space so that your map of the world of, of what's going to happen next with you and other people is predictable. If it's somewhat predictable and orderly, your anxiety levels are normal. If you don't know what's coming next, you don't know what's coming out of you next, you don't know what's coming out of the other person next, the world could fall apart crazy person jump out there, anxiety goes up. You're more nervous. Now, if you're in a roller coaster and you know a turn's coming and you're excited about it, also anxiety. But you, this is a positive projection that something you know, new or different. You know, give me anything. I've been in pandemic for two years. I want something new. So it, there's a positive expectation for the anxiety. Therefore, that's excitement. It's the same feeling peculiar behavior. If you stood up and started muttering or yelling, or maybe attacking someone next to you, all the rest of you would freeze first, because then all of a sudden this would be unexplored territory. The match between what you want and what's happening has vanished. You don't know where you are. You don't know where you are. So if somebody throws hatred at you, your boundaries fall apart. Your anxiety goes up. 
and then they tell you what's happening, gaslight you. <laughs> and you cling to the gaslighting because you're drowning because all your boundaries fell apart because they gave you contempt. They looked at your soul and they said, you're the worst thing in the world. They were doing dagger driven into you, dagger driven into you, dagger driven in. You're a piece of shit. You're a piece of shit. You're a piece of shit. You're and if this didn't work, shit. they you're went to your neighbors you're and told them shit. this. You're a piece of shit. You're a piece. <laughs> They're relentless. They're going to use hatred as a, as a rapid fire everywhere just to get under your skin. So they're there to get under your skin, under your skin, under your skin. So they're there to get under your skin. Make you have doubt, have doubt, have doubt. Laden with contempt, contempt, contempt. Laden with contempt, contempt. Dagger driven into you, dagger driven into you, dagger driven into you, dagger driven into you, dagger, oh. dr dagger driven into you. And once that hatred gets into you, Hatred destroys boundaries. <laughs> and if they sense you're already anxious, then hatred doesn't take that much hatred to make you break. So boundaries, time and space. If you have a good stable footing, time and space and place, then your anxiety is low. But if some oddball person or someone dumps hatred comes in, then your anxiety and your threat detection goes up. The match between what you want and what's happening has vanished. You don't know where you are. You don't know where you are. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You freeze first, and then maybe you cautiously, cautiously attend, or maybe you don't. Maybe you just keep your damn eyes averted, and you sit there and you hope that no one notices you. That's a prey response, right? That's like a rabbit frozen when it thinks a fox is looking at it. You act like a prey animal. And that's probably what you should do, because maybe if you keep your head down and shut the hell up, there won't be any attention attracted to you. And maybe you'll get through it, you know? You, you might decide, unlikely, to intervene and take the guy down, but you would be the exception rather than the norm. Take the guy down. So if you have ferocity and you have the warrior gene from your culture, you might fight, but most people are socialized to freeze, to hide. Because I'm, my argument is that at teenage years, when you, that teenage rebellion is supposed to happen, code, parents are codependent now, so they pacify the rebellion. They don't let the kid uh, argue. They keep up fronts. That's harder to present. But this is a model of individuation. Hey, we have to do the ritual again. Oh, what happened? She's cute. I told you she was big. That big? Baby! Oh, hey, you are in big trouble. So this is Mei Mei's uh, mom, Rage Baby, Red Panda, and then Mei Mei, the teenage 13-year-old, also has a Red Panda. But she broke rules, so mom's angry. Super Ego's angry. Young lady, oh, I'm shutting this down right now! Oh, everyone, go home! On. That's hatred, judgment, contempt. So, you guys are all misbehaving. Go home, put clothes on. Everything gets shut down because I'm Killjoy Mommy Manager. This isn't you! And I will scream at you and say, This isn't you. You cannot have a voice. Let me tell you who you are. This is me! That's what you guys need to do. Connect to your teenage rebel and bite someone's head off. Or finger. In this example. But that's not enough. Five minutes. Run, Mom! What? It was my idea 
to hustle the panda. My idea to go to Tyler's party! It was all me! So you have to own your separation in front of somebody who's trying to get you to fit in. You need some sort of rebellious stance against the world or take an initiation to show you're separate, you matter. There needs to be some sort of stance like this. I like boys! I like loud music! I like gyrating! I'm 13! Deal with it! <sighs> that caused a little bit of shock for mom. How long does it last? <laughs> Get back here! Take me! You think you're so mature! Lying to me! Lying me? How can you be so, so crass? Oh, that's nothing! You want so this is also another secret technique. Got to do this. You have to find the super ego's disgust mechanism and shake your freak out in front of the super ego. <laughs> and that's still not enough. <laughs> Concerts. I put my family first. I tried to be a good daughter. Ugh. Well, sorry, I'm not perfect. So you gotta face to face against the super ego, against your parental injunctions. Sorry, I'm not good enough. And sorry, I'll never be like you. That's what you need to do. Well, sorry, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. Well, sorry, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. Well, sorry, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not. What does that do? That's owning your shame. That's breaking out of the perfection trap. It's not saying you're shameless. That's the other trap. It's saying. You're not perfect. It's okay you're not perfect. It's embracing your humanity. It's embracing your soul. It's embracing your spirit. It's letting your inner child and your inner uh, fight get integrated. Letting your hatred point out your shadow material and integrating it in. And then you can take this natural stance. But you're still gonna face this. This isn't you. Isn't you. Not just from your super ego, from your peers, from wounded healers, from therapists. You're gonna get constant gaslighting to go back to your old self. So become a red panda. Oh, and embrace your hatred. Your hatred is extremely important. It tells you what is missing inside you. Your hatred is extremely important. It tells you what is missing inside you. Your hatred is extremely important. It tells you what is missing inside you. Your hatred is hatred is a sign of the complete loss of your boundaries in the presence of someone who is living out your shadow. Your boundaries are gone. Hatred is a sign of the complete loss of your boundaries in the presence of someone who is living out your shadow. Your So maybe we were right that resentment is a key, but it's not actually just resentment, it's hatred. And the more you're resentful for someone else to change, 
or your childhood to change is you're projecting your hatred onto that target, whatever projection your resentment is on. And you're giving up that power of whatever the judgment of your particular resentment frequency. You're waiting on your projection to do that. Instead of taking that same energy and integrating into your own uh, infrastructure. There's some sort of disowning when you're resentful or you have hatred against a certain behavior or judgment of someone else. Because it's inherently a helpless position. If you're holding resentment against somebody, they don't know it. You don't talk to them. You think your negative thoughts are going to magically change the world? <laughs> you think your moral high ground is going to change anything? That's just a waste of emotional energy. See? Hatred is tough. So, go back to the path of Brene. We hate you! 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 Because you take this armor off, we die. We die. We die. You take this armor off, we die. We die. We. It's much easier to... They're basically having an emotional reaction and blaming you. They're basically having an emotional reaction and blaming you. They're basically having an emotional reaction and blaming you. I'm just feeling really attacked right now. I'm feeling really attacked right now. I'm just feeling really attacked right now. I'm feeling really attacked right now. I'm just feeling really attacked right now. Really attacked right now. Really attacked right now. Really attacked right now. I will perfect the yeah. art of gaslighting me. Gaslighting me. I will perfect the yeah. art of gaslighting me. <laughs> <laughs> I must have caused that. 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 I must have caused I must have caused that. For not smoking. Okay. Rough presentation. <laughs> but I don't think any anybody else has tried to sell hatred, so that was a hard sell. But it's just shadow work. It's just a little more exciting way of presenting hatred. You want to do the crappy shadow work thing? Like, here's five steps of shadow work. One, two, three, and uh, it's so boring. It's it was all because great. of the pandas. <laughs> and it's va it's so valuable. This is the is a huge key that I know I've always been lacking. I, I had no understanding of of this aspect of myself or others. And um, yeah. Great, great work. Which part? <laughs> Hatred, anger, shame, teenage rebellion. And the utility thereof, you know? Mm. Yeah. The shame is, the shame is amazing. I have to go back a couple of times and go over that shame thing, but yeah. Because hatred, because maybe hatred's a way of rebellion. So as a kid, you didn't have a voice. You didn't know how to express yourself. So you had to hate something. So you redirected I matter and I care into hatred, judgment, moral certainty, attachment to the shared fantasy or whatever. But the I care and I matter part is why the hatred and the resentment and all the shared fantasies sticks. That's why it's hard to get rid of. You can't just say write it off because that's, you know, that's your unresolved grief. It's stored into hatred because that was a safe place to, put, to redirect it. And then that comes out when you're traumatized, whatever. Your hatred comes out during the reactive abuse when you get triggered. But that's not socially integrated. Then you judge yourself again for having it. Blah, blah, blah. And it's also a social, a societal issue. Um, I, at least in North America, uh, post-World War II, if someone gets a little bit hateful or you know they just they're just called hitler and it's so, like 
<laughs> it's really off balance. Hatred, hate, you know, hate. You just think Hitler. And and then and then you have, oh, you have it has hate to speech be laws. Yeah. <laughs> We're oh. actively judging and exiling hate. Uh, which is just the people that act out of hate. They're the ones that are desperate. So we're sanctioning them. The people that can hide it, like Brene Brown and other people, they make it sugary and they're just as hateful. They're just doing it in socially sanctioned or socially acceptable ways. Embrace hate. That is a hard sell. Well, the secret part was I was also selling shame, shame, self-awareness. If you want a shortcut to meditation, just sit in your shame. <laughs> and you have toxic shame. You already have tons of excessive self-awareness. So you can use your meditation on your excess toxic shame. And then it becomes a superpower because then you can use that excess uh, social hypersense sensitivity to become more socially valuable, more socially skilled. But that was a really amazing thing. Like if it was physical abuse and stuff, we will just treat it so differently. And if someone was a psycho, we treat it so differently. That was just amazing. But toxic shame, Bradshaw does pretty good at, at describing it, but it's still, sometimes it's overcomplicated. Hatred isn't too, kids know hatred. Why do we need like all these words? <laughs> kids know shame. We know this intuitively. We don't need complicated definitions and all this stuff. We just need a playground to sort of feel it out, develop our own style, find our voice, that's the secret.